Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. Helping advisors reach that next level is what Daniel Biagini does. As the head of sales at American Equity, Daniel builds on his background of guiding strategy, product development, and client experience to promote growth. Now, Brad, you could take this conversation in any number of directions, but I think all of them will be very interesting. Hey, Dan, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I think you and I share a commonality in that we both get to see a lot of very successful advisors and kind of dive into exactly what they're doing to see growth. And one of the interesting things is it's always so varied, right? You got this guy that kills it at radio, this guy that loves podcasts, guy that does seminars and seminars, which I have a uh, inkling that those guys are great. But one of the things that you and I have discussed before, and I'd love to get your take on is, you know, there's a lot of advisors doing things differently, but you work with some of the best advisors in the country. Let's start by talking about what they have in common. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my entire career has been working with that successful independent advisor. So they typically don't have the big bank, warehouse, retail space, or back office support that you might see with that type of advisor. So they're, in a sense, a little bit more creative. And I would say a lot of the IMOs certainly help them in this aspect. But all the top advisors that I've come across throughout my career really comes down to five different things that I I found out they all have in common over my years. One of the first ones that I recognize is they compete on value. So as we've seen the industry get more and more competitive, we've seen advisors' fees come down, we've seen products just jump into the market left and right. You can't just be a product pusher anymore or a product sales person. You really have to compete on different values. So All the top advisors I come across, they're not just offering, whether it's retirement solutions or just fee-based management, Um, they're really trying to do holistic planning. And a lot of them um, are bringing into their business different distribution lines as well, which helps their business as a whole. Some examples being Medicare, that's been a really hot topic lately, different advisors implementing that into their practice and really just trying to be that one-stop shop. I'm hearing more and more advisors partnering with PNC agents in their area, just making it so that their clients don't have to go elsewhere for a solution and it's bringing everything in-house. That's really been the first thing that I've seen or recognized over the years and more specifically recently. The product, the management of funds, like those sorts of things, like you kind of said, are commoditized, right? They can almost get those anywhere. When it comes to real value, do you see those top advisors are bringing in Medicare or long-term care. Do you see them starting with more educational type um, prospecting methods or are they using that second vein, if you will, only with their existing clients? I think what they're doing is trying to speak more to what clients are concerned about. So for example, you and I actually have a mutual friend who's an advisor in the business. And he, instead of saying, I'm a holistic financial advisor, he says, I focus on teaching you how to spend your money in retirement efficiently. Because when people are getting closer to retirement or even in retirement, they want to make sure that they're not going to outlive their means. They're going to make sure that they're not uh, spending too much in taxes or getting double taxed on some of their money. And really, when you bring up topics about becoming a tax minimalist, or using phrases like that resonates with the end consumer, as opposed to talking about different funds or returns or strategies, I think it resonates a lot better. And it just gets that advisor's message across clear, uh, meaning who they are and what they do for the end consumer. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So they compete on value. What else we got? The second one I've really come across a lot more recently has been they build a culture to follow. So a good example, I have an advisor friend and he's out in the Pittsburgh area. And 
when he meets with clients, there's a lot of advisors in the Pittsburgh area. He's got a lot of competition on trying to win those new clients over. And he will openly say, you might be able to get similar strategies, similar product offerings, similar financial vehicles with the advisor down the street or another advisor. But one thing you're not going to get with them is our team. I got the best team in the business and they go through all the different team members in the office and the value that they provide to the end consumer or to that client. And it gives the clients a sense of security, a sense of trust, a sense of this person's going to be there for me. It's not just all about my portfolio. It's more somebody I can rely on and sleep good at night. So building that culture has really been a strong push for advisors recently. The the everyday example I use with people is actually a, the company Peloton. So everybody knows Peloton. They took a product that's been around forever, the stationary bike or the treadmill, and they created a, a brand or a culture around it that people just wanted to be a part of. You know, you can jump into a class any time of the day. You can select what type of activities you want to compete in and, and get competitive with it. And all of a sudden you're wearing the brand, you're a part of the community, the Facebook group, whatever it is. And you're now a part of something bigger than just getting on an exercise bike. And I think advisors are seeing things like that and trying to duplicate it in their practice. I think it just makes sense too, as, as far as a consumer on that side of it, being part of something is always better than being sold something or being going to see a professional. But if you could actually be part of a community and find a culture that you're attracted to, I think even more so than today, that's where the industry is heading. And not just because the current sociological environment, but also because a lot of that money, that generational wealth is going to get passed to the spouse or get passed to the future generations. And both of those groups tend to purchase or make buying decisions based on a culture, based on a, an environment that is warm and welcoming. And whereas kind of you and I and the prominent figures now, where it's, it's a lot of fact-based conversations, you know, where that wealth is headed seems to be more of a rapport talk, right? It's not necessarily just a report. My friend Deirdre says, quit the, <laughs> quit the report, report talk and said, do rapport talk. And I love that. So I, I can totally see that, that culture aspect of, of the business just makes a lot of sense. Well, and I'll add to that is as humans, it's our natural instinct to want to be a part of a herd. So it's really as your company, as you, as the advisor, as your staff, your team, everything, you're building a herd and you're trying to attract others into that herd. And I think it's, again, just a natural instinct for humans to be drawn to people that they want to be around and run with. I love it. I love it. So we got, we're competing on value. We're building a culture to follow. All right. We got three more. I want to hear them all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The next one uh, I've seen again, more recently, it just seems to be more and more and more is they eliminate roadblocks for why somebody wouldn't do business with them or respond to their messaging. And a good example I have is I'm based out of Minnesota. A lot of advisors do different types of marketing. Obviously one of the more consistent ones over the years is going to be dinner seminars or educational workshops, maybe lunch, whatever it may be. In Minnesota, it snows up here. Roads can get bad right? So when you think about you, you book an event, you put all this time, money, and energy into getting the right restaurant or getting the right classroom. You got food there, you got coordination, AV, all this stuff that goes into putting on a successful seminar. White Glove knows the best, right? Why would somebody not show up? Why would somebody maybe not attend? Well, first and foremost, could be some bad weather. They end up being late, they just change their mind. The second thing that I come across are advisors saying they got excited when they registered, but then maybe they decided they forgot about it or they didn't have a connection with who's putting on the workshop. Again, all things White Glove is tackling, but one of the things a local advisor does here in Minnesota that I thought was brilliant is he sends out a quick video. Um, he uses Loom, but there's Bomb. You, you guys have seen them all. And the video is simply saying, hey, Dan Biagini here, looking forward to seeing you tonight. Quick update, a uh, little bit of snowfall coming this afternoon, so you might want to hop on the road a little bit early. When you arrive to the restaurant, you're going to want to park in front. You'll be greeted by whoever it is my, on my staff at the front door. Come prepared to, again, talk about taxes and retirement. That's the big subject for tonight. And we look forward to seeing you. And he'll kind of check off all the different reasons why somebody might 
not attend that night. And I will say that his show ratio for those events significantly increased when he did that. Cause they, they felt that they had a personal connection. They got to see him beforehand, but then it reminded them of what the topics were tonight and reminded them why they registered. I love that because, and that's taken something that we've preached for a long time is to proactively address objections when you're doing a seminar. But this advisor is taking it one step further and he's proactively addressing objections to even come into the seminar. And I love that. And the video idea is great because it just brings that personality back into it, right? Like you said, with the other stuff, it's, they might learn the same information somewhere else, but the more they can know, like, and trust you, that's when they're going to start doing business with you. So that, that video idea is great. And yeah, we use, we use zoom. We record videos on that and we embed those in emails. It's fairly easy to do, but we've used loom before we've used bomb bomb. There's some great and very easy platforms to, to use out there. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. So as far as the, the roadblock of those, or eliminating that roadblock, what other, what other kind of hurdles are they kind of getting out of the way that you see that are very prominent? And I will say yeah. you know, weather, weather in Minnesota is terrible. I, I bet half a year in December, I bet people show up on snowmobiles because they ride those things right down the middle of the road. So <laughs> exactly. They can cut across the frozen lakes, skip traffic. <laughs> Yeah, the other roadblocks in this one, I kind of a good analogy is um, everybody has Amazon for the most part. Everybody buys things off Amazon. Um, I think my wife has got to be some form of preferred customer with them. Our front doors constantly getting boxes dropped off on a daily basis. But in, when you think about Amazon, it, a lot of people forget that they implemented that button that says one click purchase instead of add to your cart checkout later or add your cart, review your cart, then purchase. That one-click purchase significantly increased their sales because it eliminated that opportunity to second guess, forget, change their mind by putting it in the cart. So I've seen advisors implement something similar on their website. Instead of book time with me in three weeks, um, they'll have a Calendly link, something like this where it says book 15 minutes right now. And all they're doing is giving them an opportunity to connect with somebody in the office. Now that somebody might not be the advisor and answering their questions right then and there, but it's somebody in their office to immediately create that introduction, that relationship to eventually get them to an advisor. If it is an advisor right there on the spot, the more you can give somebody or take away a reason to not connect with you, the more success you're going to have, plain and simple. That is the most interesting concept that I've heard because it's at first I was like, well, how are they going to do that? Like, how is someone going to be available when they book now and blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as I had that objection, I thought, oh, well, it's how different is it than putting your phone number on the website? Like no different, right? You someone has to answer the phone. This is the same mentality. You just, okay, book now and grab that Zoom meeting or that call or whatever. But yeah, I love the the formality of something that is already baked into the process, right? There's already a phone number on the website that they could call, but if they're saying book now, oh, okay. Well, now it's a now it's even more formal, but it feels like a totally different experience. Exactly. All right. I love that one. I'm writing that one down. I'm gonna start using it <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah, the next one is fairly conceptually obvious, but I'll get into the weeds just a hair. The top advisors that I meet with that have grown significantly all know their numbers down to the very decimal. I'm oftentimes in front of an advisor that, you know, brings on $10 million of assets a year and they're trying to get to 20 and they just can't quite figure out what's going to get them over the hump. And it usually comes down to inefficiencies in either their processes, their marketing or somewhere in their numbers. And once you can give them a guide to kind of walk through where you're doing your marketing, the cost, the spend, the return, uh, whatever it may be, and then dial it in zero laser focus to this is what's working, this isn't, or we need to pour some gasoline on this and maybe slow this down. That's when the scaling really starts to happen. And I think, again, I try and make real life examples. Obviously, Moneyball, the movie, for those that have seen it, the Oakland A's, when they decided to bring data analytics into a low budget franchise and really compete. I mean, that's the most obvious form of it in real life. I love that. And I'll 
totally agree with you. The advisors that we work with that are the most successful that end up doing more and more with us, they know their data cold. You could just ask them any stat and they know it because they track everything down to like what type of water they put on the table at the local library. Like these guys come in and they say, this is what we want to do. This is what we see the most success with. And what's interesting is so many other advisors go based off of gut and we're all entrepreneurs, right? We have that gut feeling that got us into this business, that got us started, that that did us very well in the beginning. But I'll talk to advisors that that go back and look at the data and say, oh, you know what? I walked out of that seminar and I thought I crushed it. I thought everybody in the room loved me. These are my people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see some real success here. And then they'll have a seminar the next night and it'll be a total flop in their eyes and they'll say, hey. Nobody engaged. Nobody likes me. I feel real down on myself. This is terrible. But when they go back and look at the data, the results it could uh, could be flip flopped. The dead night could be the one where they made their biggest return. And sometimes, as a competent competent entrepreneur with lots of ideas, we learn to trust our gut so much that we don't go back and look at the data. And you're hundred just hundred percent right, spot on. The advisors that see real growth. They built it off of their intuition, but they confirmed it off of the data. And that's where they made those adjustments. You, you just made me think of something else. This past week, I was traveling in and out of Florida, different areas. And to your point of, I might have a meeting and you made the comment, nobody liked me. It, it didn't go well. And they didn't really dive into why it didn't go well. Um, in my two different meetings with bigger organizations this past week, the first one was a company that's a large company. They do great business. They've been relatively flat for the last three and a half years. Same numbers each year, maybe 5% up or down. Our meeting when we got to the office didn't start until 30 minutes after we got there. They were seven or eight minutes late greeting us at the security at the front desk to bring us up to the room. Then they had to have IT come in to fix their Wi-Fi. We couldn't get our presentation up on their screen. And then they asked anybody if they wanted coffee, a little bit of chit chat. 30 minutes in is when we decided that we were going to start the business meeting. The second meeting I went to, 40 minutes away, we walked in. They had our presentation that we had already emailed up on the screen. They had a table with Fiji waters on a coaster in each person's spot. They ordered in a little bit of snacks, not big sandwiches, but just something to pick on because they know we were running hard. And just how you show up is going to dictate how your success is. And that second group has seen exponential growth year after year after year. And I think it's little things like that advisors might overthink. And typically it's, you're going to push that to somebody on your staff, on your team to help keep you accountable. But I always encourage advisors to think about how you show up. What's your first impression? Cause you typically only get one of those. I love that. Well, million years ago, working in retail, I'd run a few different locations of a home improvement company. And what we used to do with the managers of each store is we would have them go in and shop their competitor or shop or their you know, their partners, if they're in this area, they're in this area, just go in with a fresh set of eyes and say, Hey, this is dusty. This isn't set up correctly. This cashier isn't as nice as we thought she would be. But for an advisor, you know, that would be a, a huge opportunity for them to get another advisor that you like and that you trust. And you guys are friends and just like to shop each other, come into the office with brand new eyes and say, Hey, you know what? It took me too long to get in here. Your parking's atrocious. Your receptionist was okay, but she wasn't super nice or he didn't help me with the X, Y, and Z. To see that with a fresh set of eyes and then kind of come back to your own firm and say, okay, this is what they did great. I like it. This is what they did terrible. I hated it. And this is what I'm doing that is exactly as terrible as they're doing. You know, I love that, you know, that thought of fresh eyes coming into you. you and I get to see it every day, right? We see this advisor mm -hmm. doing it this way, this advisor doing it another way, but maybe that's something that advisors should just schedule out. Hey, once a quarter, they go see another advisor and just see how things are going. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I get the benefit of sitting at the carrier level and working with advisors all over the country and IMOs alike. RIAs alike. What's nice about our team at American Equity, we have nine regional wholesalers around the country and they're seeing advisors each and every day. They're able to share things that are working that maybe aren't 
in their in the advisor's backyard, you know, their competitions in their backyard, but it's just little things that they can help advisors with. So when they're meeting with advisors, it isn't just, you know, here's the American equity product, here's where we compete. It's but here's a couple of things I'm seeing around the country that are working for other advisors, just something to think about. If you want to dive deeper, we can. And I think that adds a lot of value to my team specifically, being able to recognize those opportunities. I love it. I love it. All right. If I didn't did my math right, we got one more. We got one more. <laughs> yeah. Right. This last one is definitely the most important, specifically for advisors that want to grow. There is advisors out there that want the lifestyle practice, work two, three days a week. They have their max amount of clients and assets they want, and that's fine. But the, for, ones, for the ones that want to scale and really scale, the way I labeled this one is they do it before it's ready to be done. I'll give you the real life example again first, and then we'll talk about at the advisor level. Real life example is Tesla. Everybody knows Tesla, the electric sports car. Well, Tesla didn't form because there was this overwhelming demand for an electric sports car. And nobody was asking for it. They did it before it was ready to be done. And the early press, I love, I have a presentation where I share some snippets, some press releases of Tesla stock drops below IPO. I think it was like $8 at the time. Tesla, two cars crash and burn on fire. This isn't going to work. And all the bad press they got. Well, fast forward, obviously it's, it's ready. And you see all the legacy car manufacturers, the Fords, the GMs, everybody's getting into the space and there's new people coming up. So they're, they did it significantly before it was ready to be done. Now at an advisor level, again, you and I have some mutual acquaintances in the business. I can think of one specifically, he had enough business for him and maybe a little bit of extra business where he needed to bring on some help. He went out and hired uh, four, now five junior associates before he had the business because he knew that if he wanted to scale, he had to be in front of more people as fast as possible. And he didn't have the business sitting there waiting for them. But what happened is he created his own problem that he had to find a solution for. I know he's a big white glove advocate. You guys helped him solve that problem and they are firing on all cylinders. I don't know an advisor that I can think of off the top of my head that's growing faster than he is. So for the advisors that are saying, you know, I'm going to try that marketing next year. I'm going to try hiring somebody after Q1 or I need to budget for this budget. For, I would say do it and then figure out how to make it work because that's really what's going to catapult you to, to where you want to be. My favorite thing that you said or almost said that I now want to now want to want to put on a t-shirt is create your own problems. You know, create the problems that you want to have. Oh, I have so much um, so much bandwidth for more business. Now I need more business, or I'm ready to go with this great idea. And I love that mentality. Piggybacking on the Tesla analogy or the story there. You know, Ford Motor Company did just the opposite, right? We all know that they made the assembly line and started cranking out Model Ts where everybody had one. They were dominating. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing a Model T. And they, they dominated and they didn't adapt. They didn't create any new problems for them. They said, nope, we're not changing anything. You can have any color you want as long as it's black. And this is how we do it. And they ended up losing huge market shares to companies that came out with a blue car or put windshield wipers on the car or, or put cushioned seats in there, whatever little enhancements they ended up losing because they weren't creating problems. They were refined their process and didn't adapt. So I, I mean, that to me is, I think you're right. I think that was the best one yet. Something that goes along with that. I've worked with different business consulting firms and individuals over the years that try and help advisors scale and grow. And there's an individual years ago that we were in a meeting with an advisor and they were very successful already, but they were trying to get an evaluation. And then all of a sudden it turned into, well, I actually think I want to grow for five more years, then figure out a succession plan or an exit strategy. And he said, I just, I've gotten to this point and I just can't seem to get bigger. And the consultant just brilliantly said, every business is designed perfectly to get what they're getting. And what he meant by that is if you are getting what you're getting, that's because everything you're doing is making sure of it. So if you want to change what you're getting, you have to approach it completely differently. We need to start thinking about all the things you're not doing, thinking about things. Again, we need to pour gasoline on things. We need to stop doing. 
we have to look at it completely differently. But I just love the way he put that. Every business is perfectly designed to get what they're getting. Oh, I love that. Okay, now there's two t-shirts coming out of this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're getting close on on time here, Dan. What, you know, as as a fellow entrepreneur out here in the industry, you know, is there is there any final thoughts that you want to kind of give the advisors listening today as as far as what they should be looking at? Here's some five great tips that we covered today to see some real growth. Where should they start? What's the next steps that they should be taking after they they listen to this? Yeah, for myself, something I do with my team. And so for the advisors out there that have a team, and if it's not somebody internally, you have an IMO partner or an RIA partner somebody at White Glove that does your marketing, whatever it may be, get with whoever your team is and plan some form of offsite. And during that offsite, you're going to be able to just get off the hamster wheel because advisors love to just keep going, keep going, keep going, meeting after meeting after meeting, marketing after marketing after marketing. Stop what you're doing and try and do some real strategic planning. Now, again, I'm in Minnesota. We're the state of hockey right? Everybody here, you can hear it in my accent. I call us in Canada. The best hockey player that everybody knows, even if you're not a hockey player, was Wayne Gretzky. And I don't think anybody will ever touch the records he's made. The thing about Wayne Gretzky is he wasn't the biggest. He wasn't the fastest. He didn't have the hardest shot, the best hands, whatever it may be. But the famous quote Wayne Gretzky has is, I always went to where the puck was going to be. So when you look at our industry, the financial services, insurance industry, whatever it may be, I think there's been more change in the past two, three, four years than the last 20. Technology, data-driven results, marketing. Most of the top advisors nowadays are implementing multiple forms of marketing, not just workshops. They now have digital workshops that obviously your company provides, but then there's TV, there's radio, there's getting involved in charities, there's uh, nonprofits, client events, whatever it may be. Start thinking about, as an industry, what you need to do to not only survive, but thrive and figure out where the puck's going to be. Because in this changing environment, again, the only thing we can guarantee is that it's going to continue to change. Um, So try and work with your team, figure out what's best with your team to figure out where the puck's going to be and start working towards that as quick as possible. I love that, sir. So I'm sure that there's probably advisors listening today that say, hey, I want to talk to this Dan guy and pick his brain a little bit more. Is there a good way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, I can give you my email, daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L, dot B a genie, B as in boy, I-A-G-I-N-I, and that's at American-Equity.com. And you can also stalk them on LinkedIn. That's how I stalked them and and got his attention. And if you're not on LinkedIn advisors, as I always say, you should be, you're missing out. So thanks so much for being on the show today. Definitely a value packed half hour. Really appreciate it. I took a lot of notes. Um, I'm going to start doing some of this stuff myself. Well, thanks again for having me. Appreciate it. Don't miss any episode of Be Advised Leading with Value. All you have to do is subscribe or follow the podcast and please Share with friends and colleagues. Thank you for listening to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.